Uh, all right, cool. Um, hi, my name is Amir Bergeron. Um, I wanted to talk about um, AR and art in a particular way so that we kind of understand the modalities within which um, art um, functions so that um, when we need to bring AR into that field, um, um, it, 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 we basically kind of um, ensure that it is perceived and received well, uh, which is not always an easy task. Um, uh, from my own personal experience, a lot of museums or galleries um, have started utilizing AR, but it mainly it has been to display art or to use it as didactic purposes, for didactic purposes. What I mean is that they're using it for usefulness of it. Um, my particular take on, on this venture is to move it away from the didactic part, move it away from the resource um, fullness of it, moving it away from usefulness of it, and try to utilize this medium for artistic creation. And uh, that's not an easy task, to be honest. Um, uh, the art world is, as many of you might know, is quite conservative when it comes to um, collectability. And, uh, and uh, if you look at the history of photography, for example, um, for the first, you know, almost 100 years, um, they, it was not considered as an art form. It wasn't up to 1920s that we had scholars starting writing about it. And it, up to 1950s, I believe, in museums, uh, in the Western world, they would not frame a photograph because a true work of art, which was a painting, was supposed to be framed. And uh, it was only worthy of the, the author, you know, to be framed and, and not a photographer. So photographers were often considered as um, technicians. And I think this is what we see with AR as well, um, without being too, too reductive in terms of correlating these two technologies. but. I think we, we feel, I, I personally feel the same way, so um, uh, it, it's quite hard to make museums or galleries understand what AR is, and, and that makes it very difficult as well, so that you know, when, when a collector comes and they want to purchase a, 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 an artwork that's uh, utilizing AR, you have half of your discussion that has to be towards making them understand what AR is, so, and then you can get to the content or to the medium or the aesthetics aspect of it. So, it, 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 there's a lot of learning involved. But, but I guess uh, that applies to any other field. I think, you know, advertising as well has, um, you know, th people doing advertising are running the same kind of troubles as well. Um, let me, so is this working? Oh, okay, here you go. All right, so I want to start with, um, I'm just going to go through these uh, ones very, very quickly. Um, dun, dun, dun. Okay. Um, sorry about that. Um, oh, God. Um, So I just want to show a few of my previous projects very quickly. I utilize my body. I'm a performance artist. So I utilize my body. I love to include old technologies. Um, in this particular case, when I came up with the movement Futurism, that references the Futurist movement from 100 years ago, um, uh, I went for stamping of calligraphy that I had done that referenced um, a Persian poetry. and then. Um, it, it, I turned it into a sandwich board upon which my manifesto was to be read. So that's the kind of juxtaposition of old and new technology that I always uh, like to do. Um, for those familiar, I've done franchise in Mona Lisa, so the infiltration that took place in, um, in the Louvre. I am very proud to say that I'm um, part of the permanent collection of the Louvre right now because Louvre cannot kick me out, so um, <laughs> it's... 
kind of a fun thing. I did the same thing. Um, I, I love infiltration. I did another infiltration, not AR, but I infiltrated all New York taxi cabs at some point a few years ago. Um, I, so I did with um, Venice Biennale as well, um, thanks to Junayo who helped me. Where is Junayo somewhere? Um, but um, what happened throughout the last year is that I tried to move away from these kinds of um, um, bring your own device um, installations whereby I'm putting somewhere something and I say to people, bring your iPad, bring your iPhone. I tried to move away from that and bring it into something that would be more cohesive, all inclusive in a way. So um, the first iteration of that is called the buzz that I showed uh, which you can see at the um, uh, presentation hall right here. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about it because I'm going to show that in the Augies as well, but the idea was that I was able to um, create an installation that was self-sufficient. So that it had the iPad, it was charging all the time, that it had its, um, uh, you know, the, the, the markers were ready as well, and it was to be sold or to be collected as an ensemble. And, and I think this has been a, a quite fascinating um, venture for me to be part of that because um, uh, it, it's very difficult when you think about creating a, a, an installation that, uh, that has everything you need in it. And, and once you, you do it, then you're like, oh my God, there, there are so many things that you know, we take for granted. So um, I'm gonna be quick. I, I know we don't have much time. Um, I just want to show you one more piece here. This is a piece that I did for the VIP opening of Armory, which is the art fair in New York. Um, it's a performance that I did. So I, again, I took the Samovar, uh, it was the concept was around um, Tea House. So I took a very old antique Samovar and you had this iPad underneath of it. And once you would take your saucer in front of it, you would have one drop of tea. So again, that juxtaposition of um, old and new, um, the very physical um, versus the virtual altogether is something that fascinates me. Um, you know, and there was, a, you know, I'm a performance, I do a lot of chanting in my performances, so, you know, this is where I was praying to the thing to get the tea that I wanted. Um, in that same um, place, um, as I'm moving away from, from you know, I'm, I'm turning it into bigger and bigger installations, I've come up with a technology that allows me to do my performances with screens um, that do motion detection um, so that I would be able to raise, for example, in this case, I was able to raise tea and uh, pour tea into each other and there was a session of breaking the sugar cone and uh, sugar loaf in a way and, and the juxtaposition of the real sugar that was done then distributed to the audience versus this tea that they could only enjoy virtually was something that I wanted to achieve. And this is more specifically the look of the device. So the idea was that performance often uh, is very subjective. Each person views it personally. In this case, you have these um, screens that allows you to see the performance um, um, in a mediated way as well. So it's an uh, adulterated perception of the performance. and the audience can move around, so they have the option of looking at the performance solely through their eyes or looking at it through this window of opportunity in a way. Um, how long do I have? I'm sorry? Oh yeah, fantastic. So I wanna do quickly, um, I wanna tell you about um, the three challenges that I have realized um, are uh, with AR and um, so one is accessibility. So obviously, whether, you know, um, and, and mainly for, for those who use um, geolocators and they, they request that you bring your own device to the event, um, accessibility is important. So does everyone have the device? Um, is there internet? Um, um, what are the steps that takes you to get to that point? You know, how many clicks are there? Um, and most importantly, on the part of the artist, um, I myself don't code, I'm not a poet, so I always use poets around me, among which uh, Patrick here, who has been very helpful in, in making a lot of things that I do. So um, I I in that case, it's expensive. So that's another question of accessibility. So not all artists can have the luxury of playing with AR and exploring it. And that's a little bit sad, I think, 
if there are any funders around, please do fund artists. Um, the second part, which is really important, is collectivity, uh, collectability, sorry. So, um, as, again, as I was saying, everything has to be in the same package. You have to think of, of you know, for my gallery, for example, for him to even start thinking about exhibiting this kind of thing, if he really, because, you know, if he really wants to make money in a way, and if he wants to sustain this as a foreseeable, collectible piece, um, everything has to be in it. It should not be techy, it should not be gadgety, it should be one click, you know, and you do it all. And these are challenges that I personally have, have found, um, have faced because of the technology, because of the devices we have. So it makes it very difficult. So how do you convince a gallery? How do you convince a museum to say, well, you know, you would also need to not only, you know, to to develop the piece, but also for the duration of the one month or three month of the exhibition, you would also need to have a tech person on site who will make sure that every, every time somebody clicks the wrong button, they would be able to reset it. So that thing, and, and if you don't do that, then the whole show is over and it's not gonna be seen as serious and therefore the, the immediate answer, which I've received in many cases, is that, well, it's too infantile as a technology for art. So let's, you know, come back, you know, when the technology allows you to do something better. And I think that's something that I've been working very much towards so that it becomes self-sustained and easy, easy, easy. Um, uh, just to remember, the best example of it is that uh, it should become as easy as a painting that you hang in your, in your living room. If you want to turn it into a piece that's collectible, that's marketable within the art world, which has its own problems. I'm not getting into that, but I'm just talk talking about ways in which this could part possibly infiltrate the art world as is. Um, the, the last part, which is super important as well, is archivability. Um, so the warranty of the device. If I'm using an iPad, you know, uh, Apple has all uh, kinds of things that you cannot sell it, you cannot do this, you cannot do that, and there's a lot of problems with that. What do you do in terms of codes when they get outdated or when there are updates with the operating system? And if you have sold that piece, for example, to, to a collector, to a gallery, then you have to recall the piece. Sometimes these gigantic things cost a lot of money, so you have to recall the thing, or you have to send the tech. So these are a lot of challenges that we face, and um, I don't have the solutions to them. <laughs> I'm working on them. Um, I wanna give you a very quick thing. How long do I have? Okay, fantastic. So uh, I wanna tell you about a piece that I did at British Museum. Um, if you want to disagree about that, great. Okay. Yeah, so one each table, that would be great. So these are, so British Museum, through a symposium mm -hmm. they were doing, they asked me to do, to do an artwork for them. So I said, okay, I'm gonna bring AR. So I showed them the buzz, which was really fascinating, um, because I'm pushing the boundaries of AR. And I told them, for the performance piece itself, I had told everyone that I was going to push the boundaries of AR even further to an unimaginable level. So when they got to the space, everyone was given one of these um, glasses that are my AR glasses, concocted, um, you know, they're signed and, and uh, edition pieces. So everybody had to p put them on. So the, the event went something it like this. So I'm not going to show you the whole thing. You can see it on my website. But the idea was that I was in front of all these people. I told them that there was a big screen behind me that said, activate your AR glasses. So here they are, they're expecting to see something. My artwork is mainly about the promise of technology. I never work in terms of what is available, I mainly work in terms of what could be possibly um, use, used in the future. So um, he, here they are, curators and directors of all major museums, a lot of older people who have never heard of augmented reality, um, let alone AR glasses. So. <laughs> Um, they're trying to make this work. So they, you know, as, as I'm like performing and it's, I have 16 performers behind me and you don't see what they're holding and I'm like going through shattering of the thing, which you can see, you know, it goes, you know, into, sh I shatter the whole thing and I'm supposed to plant a tree 
inside the British Museum. So I have a magical tree. So anyway, so I'm just going to go through it. So I go through my chanting, I plant the tree, and, and this is what happens. Um, I plant it, and sup they're supposed to have to see apples, and they don't see it, so they're frustrated. And it's at that very moment that they realized that they, there was no AR, you know, it was all in the head. So what I did was that... So I had my 16 performers who went to the thing and they each had, they had real apples and they distributed apples. So again, that moment of um, juxtaposing the real thing that's like the delicious apple that you can possibly uh, have. And they were saying in Persian in a very convivial way, have apple, have apple. Um, I'm not going to do more. I'm just going to show you one more thing um, uh, before I leave. Uh, I won the, um, I was very lucky to win Ismar's um, this year's, I mean last year's um, uh, Future of AR um, video. So uh, Ismar was asking for artists to send, how do you perceive the future of AR? And this is how I perceive it. And sample as drinking water is a Persian expression that resembles like easy like, um, like a piece of cake, I guess. That's how it um, translates. So this is how I foresee the future of AR. Please have a look. That's it. Thank you so much.